So we're starting with uh, Professor Gwerwich, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Professor Reisman, I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Reisman, uh, he will be uh, talking about the legacy of Adam Turk as patron of dogs. Uh, you will have to now. Okay. Is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? I understand that I speak better on my feet than sitting down. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak about Kamal Atatürk's dimension, one of many of his dimensions and one of many of his visions. Thank you. This speaks for itself. Modern Turkey's culture is an amalgam of many other cultures, of many other peoples who have crossed that land. Among these were the Hittites, the Seljuks, the Ottomans, Some cultures did have representative sculpture, as can be seen from archaeological excavations. Then came diamonds and the Islamic religion. For many centuries, actually four centuries, Living beings could not be represented in any form. Yes, calligraphy, miniatures, and what we call the bizarre art did have some living-like figures um, outlined. Sculpture did not exist whatsoever throughout the land. And it took the average citizen, many years, to accept a three-dimensional representation of a human being. In 1923, from actually before 1923, the arts were a total non-factor in the Ottoman economy. But all that changed in 1923. The first public installations of art were started then. But that was also a watershed year for all of Turkish arts. What was forbidden by religion became nurtured, subsidized, and promoted by the new government of Turkey. Turkey sent a number of its promising young people to Europe to continue their studies in the arts. And Turkey invited accomplished sculptors from Central Europe to come and create monuments. Art awareness became the order of the, A, of the day throughout the land. There was increased communication between artists, namely sculpt sculptors, and painters at all levels. Competitions were established, awards for sculpture were given, new schools at the secondary level taught art, including sculpture, academies and training institutes, museums and exhibitions and galleries were all opened up. 
at the very, very grassroots level, the Halteri people's houses were organized, which taught culture, including art, including sculpture, at the grassroots level in the various villages, not just cities. Monuments depicting the leadership were created and displayed not just in Ankara and Istanbul, but in outlying cities as well. Among the sculptors who were invited from Central Europe were Heinrich Krippel, Pietro Canonica, Joseph Thorak, and Rudolf Belling. Now, Rudolf Belling was quite different from all others in a number of ways. He was the first European sculptor to enter non-representational or abstract art. He was also one of the five sculptors invited who started teaching Turkish nationals the art of sculpture. He was also different in that he had to leave Nazi Germany because his wife was, his first wife was Jewish and he had a son. Remember this second, second slide, Turkey, I'm, I'm sorry, culture is the goal of the Turkish nation. At the same time, Joseph Kemp Gables, a PhD from Heidelberg University, a well-known university, said publicly, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. And in fact, in public, he was always seen in a Nazi uniform carrying a revolver, although he never served in the German military because he was rejected. Now, moving back to Turkey, here's Rudolf Belling in a sculpture studio in Turkey with women among his students. Here's one of his sculptures which you may recognize. I think it's the one near Machka. Among many of Belling's students were people whose names you will recognize. And they, in turn, taught the next generation of Turkish sculptors. So that by now, there's very hard, it is very hard to talk to a Turkish sculptor of this generation, the youngest generation, whose education cannot be traced back to Belling through several, one or two intermediate generations. One of them is Ilhan Komen, my favorite. Ilhan Komen sculptures you will recognize. Here's a frieze that he did for the Atatürk's um, crematorium. Here he is finishing a sculpture that can be seen on an Istanbul street. Here he is, no, that's me, in front of a sculpture that he did, which is now in part of the Central Istanbul Museum Gallery, which in turn is a converted powerhouse, power plant. A wonderful facility. Who's in Anka? Again, a sculptor, a ballet student, whose sculptures you will recognize if you had ever visited Anka. This is one of his sculptures of Sinan, Mimar Sinan, one of the famous Turkish uh, architects. 
Now there's an interesting anecdote about Anka. He created a sculpture of an artillery corporal that was displayed, and still is displayed, at Gallipoli. This is the sculpture he originally cre created. Then somebody, in digging through the archives, and you see archives are important, found that the corporal actually carried these heavy artillery shells on, on his back. And so, here's the new version of the sculpture. Public sculpture can now be found in every city and every village of Turkey. At the last count, Ankara had no fewer than 250 public installations, outdoor installations, much more so than my city, Cleveland, Ohio. Now, during the time of the Ottomans, painting did depict living beings, but as part of calligraphy. There were miniatures and what we call bizarre art. Some, in the latter part of the Ottoman Empire, some of the military academies started to teach drafting. And as part of the drafting, they snuck in some illustration. And so that, from there came an, a few, about a half a dozen painters who mostly painted Ottoman hierarchy in their various dresses, dress codes. One of them you will recognize was Osman Hamdi Bey, and another, Shekhar Ahmed Pasha. This is a world-famous painting, now available and shown at Pearl Museum. This is one of Shekhar Ahmed Pasha's famous painting. As you can imagine, some of the art that was available until 1923, even in painting, was somewhat behind what Europe went through. Cubism and uh, all the other isms. So, Anatur invited Leopold Levy, a French academic painter. Here is his um, um, official card. Lockport Levy had already been well established in France. He showed in many, many very, very important um, galleries. The Walder. Actually, I think the name that is shown for this gravure is a mislabeling. I, I think he meant the tinkerer. Uh, soldering was probably more likely for him to have done than arc welding, which we do now. <clears throat> the first generation of Levy-educated painters, as I said, were those who went into academ academia and taught other Turkish painters. The names you might or may not recognize. There were, there were two schools of French academic, I'm sorry, Turkish painters. One of the guys I like very much is Adnan Varenka, who is still pretty much alive and still quite coherent. And I happened to meet and chat with him on my last trip to Istanbul last this month, I think. <laughs> he painted a painting called Esther. I understand that this painting is now a national treasure piece. Um, it's in a private collection. Now, the story goes that when 
He first painted Esther. He brought this drawing, painting, to his mentor, Leopold Levy. And Leopold Levy looked at it and said, you know what? Buy yourself a new canvas and start all over again. You can give this painting to the concierge who will probably appreciate it. It is now its second reincarnation. It's a national treasure. So you see, academicians are not always right. The next, the current generation, young people, Malut Achilles, very irre irreverent, I painter, 